Raymond Francis Sarmiento from the National Telehealth Center of the National Institutes of Health, uh, University of the Philippines, Manila. And together with me again, I'm uh, extremely thrilled to share this hosting duties with my mentor, uh, who is also a board member at the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, Dr. Susie Marcado. Dr. Susie? Sorry. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, good afternoon to everyone who's watching on the playback as well. Um, we'd like to welcome you to this um, partnership of the University of the Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. Uh, we are committed to bringing to you the latest information on clinical management of COVID. I know everybody out there is groping, struggling to find information that will help keep our patients uh, safer, alive, caring for them better. And uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from, from different parts of the country of um, the, really the need for quick dissemination of information from people who are doing work on the front line. So just welcome to this webinar. Thank you for those who are coming again. And uh, we've got a very uh, exciting webinar uh, in front of us. So I just wanted to to say welcome again to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Susi. Uh, before we introduce our um, uh, special resource speaker for today, uh, I'll, I'd like to take this chance to be able to thank and acknowledge uh, the following groups who, have, uh, who are making and have made this webinar series possible. We start off with the University of the Philippines Office of the Vice President uh, an uh, office of the president, of course, uh, led by uh, and, and represented by Executive Vice President uh, Dr. Ed Herbosa, the office of the Vice President for Public Affairs, uh, led by Dr. Elena Pernia, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, as represented here by uh, PhilHealth Board Member Dr. Susie Mercado, and also the one who will be giving our opening remarks before our resource speaker, uh, the UP Manila NIHS uh, National Telehealth Center. The University of the Philippines uh, Technology Interactive and, Devel uh, and Development Center, TVUP, and, uh, and the Internet Television Network of the University of the Philippines, uh, the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital, and everyone who has helped to make this learning series possible. So, for for uh, our opening remarks, I will give the floor to Dr. Susi Mercado to introduce our very special guest. Thank you very much, Raymond. So. Um, this afternoon, we have someone from the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. You see her on media a lot. She's the official spokesperson of PhilHealth, and she's currently vice president for Corporate Affairs Group and a very strong supporter of um, this initiative of getting more information on clinical management of COVID out to all the accredited PhilHealth providers, hospitals, facilities, and so on. So it's my pleasure to welcome Foundation and pray. Saludo po kami sa lahat ng health workers from PhilHealth. Uh, salamat po sa inyong lahat and thank you for joining in. Uh, never has our health sector been tested as we are being tested now. And uh, maybe uh, you're wondering uh, why uh, PhilHealth is here in this uh, webinar, uh, joining uh, PGH, uh, joining all this... Um, uh, organizers of this webinar. Uh, well, uh, for one thing, um, uh, for three, uh, for lots of things. One, uh, this uh, pandemic, this health crisis, we believe, uh, has some uh, um, opportunities and lessons that we have to learn from. Uh, one is that uh, this is the time to assess our health system. Our health system is, has uh, been placed, uh, put was put into a test, and uh, it is time for us to assess the strength and weaknesses of our health system. So the time is now. Uh, we have to prepare because uh, hindi po natin alam whether the near future, the far future, I don't know, there might be a second wave of uh, COVID. We have to prepare now. And we believe that uh, continuing education is a major factor in preparing our health sector for anything uh, that will come you know, now or in the future. Uh, two, 
health co health outcomes better health outcomes is a major objective of our of our health system and alam ko nga uh, lahat kayo diyan yun rin talaga ang primary goal ninyo for being there in our health system better health outcomes for our kababayans no so uh, we believe also again continuing education uh, is a uh, big portion of uh, determining health outcomes of course, we have also to take into consideration features like quality, efficiency of our health system. And the uh, ko, continuing education is the way to go. Uh, we cannot get away from that. So uh, we have been uh, responding, uh, to PhilHealth has been responding to this uh, health crisis. Uh, strategic purchaser po kami. Funding is our uh, main role in the health uh, sector. Uh, we have uh, given out or set aside around 30 billion as a, a response uh, to our healthcare uh, providers, no? Uh, prepositioning these funds to our hospitals para naman uh, may pera na sila dyan pag uh, kailangan, no? So uh, with that, uh, hindi ko nahabayan because I know we have a very interesting uh, lecture now. Uh, again, I would like to thank everyone for joining, joining this webinar. Sana tuloy-tuloy po ito. Uh, not only now in COVID, pero sana tuloy-tuloy na. Uh, touching base always with our healthcare providers there in the field. So thank you very much everyone and uh, enjoy this webinar. Salamat po. Maraming salamat po, uh, VP Gigi, for that wonderful message for all of us. And uh, we are very happy to hear that PhilHealth will be uh, here now and in the future po, no, in terms of supporting all of our endeavors for this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, before we move on into the introduction of our resource speaker, maybe we can flash on the screen uh, just a few of, uh, fun questions po, and these are poll questions that have been provided po by our presenter. Uh, the ones that uh, you see here on the screen uh, are questions that the, you, those who have, who have registered and have entered the Zoom webinar will be able to provide answers to. So for our very first poll question, it reads... Wala pa, Raymond. <laughs> oh, <nga po. laughs> We're waiting no, for the other question. Na, ulit, ulit. Okay, okay. Let's go to the poll question, please. No, that's not the one. Okay, here we go. There we go. Okay. For the very first uh, poll question, uh, number one, is the Philippines a part of the solidarity trial launched by the World Health Organization to test the safety and effectiveness of possible therapies in treating COVID-19? Uh, responses are slowly trickling in. Uh, and there have there are also a few more who have already uh, moved on or proceeded to answering our question number two. But for question number one, uh, nearly a hundred percent of our attendees have answered yes that uh, the Philippines is indeed part of the solidarity trial. And then for question number two, question number two Paul, reads: the treatment options are included in the international randomized clinical trial of the WHO except so ang exceptions po na nakalagay dito in answering or uh, putting in the responses uh, for neclosimide but for the correct answers po uh, please stay tuned until the end of our webinar uh, for Dr. Isa Alendria to share the correct answers po for these questions and I, I will turn over the floor to Dr. Susie Mercado so that uh, she could uh, seed with introducing our resource speed. Thank you very much, Raymond. Um, we're also seeing a lot of activity in the chat box, so I encourage you to go to the chat. Uh, say something. Tell us where you're you're from. Uh, in fact, we just saw something here. Somebody watching from uh, from the U.S. Uh, Rolando Madela saying hello to. To, to our speaker. So just, uh, you know, let's let's make this very informal. We're here to learn. We're here to um, interact. And uh, when you have questions, you can put them on the chat box. But because we only have one speaker for today, you will have a lot of time later to ask your questions. So 
put your name oh there so we have people coming in from Lucena okay and um I think as always we're going to have people from all over the country we currently have 251 people on uh on the live webinar and um we we see thousands coming in on the playback so uh just keep on interacting there and um we hope that uh this will be a very productive session for you so it's my honor to present our speaker for today uh, who is the director of the Institute of Clinical Epidemiology of the National Institutes of Health. She's also a um, professor of the UP College of Medicine and um, president of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. And, you know, a lot of the guidelines that we're using at PhilHealth now, if not all of them, and the guidance that's going to the international, to the interagency uh, task force, the IATF, that's handling this pandemic, is coming from this group from PISMID, where uh, our our speaker for today is is the president. So it's my honor, and without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Marisa Alejandria, who's also known as Isa. Isa, welcome to the webinar, and um, thank you for all the work that you've been doing for our country. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, classmate Susie for the kind introduction. Okay. Thank you, Raymond and Dr. Gigi for the uh, welcome remarks. And of course, uh, I'd like to greet everyone out there listening. So thank you for spending your lunchtime listening to this webinar. So hello to my classmates, batchmates, colleagues out there. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. So the uh, topic assigned to me for this afternoon is the treatment landscape for COVID-19. So I hope to be able to uh, paint a beautiful picture for everyone with regards to where we are as far as the management of COVID-19 is. Okay. So what I'll do in the next or, uh, 30 minutes or so is to review the pharmacology of uh, investigational drugs that we are using now for COVID-19, particularly focusing on antiviral drugs. And I'll also present to you the WHO solidarity trial that the Philippines is currently uh, participating on. Okay. So before I do that, let's just uh, review the coronaviruses, no? let's review what SARS-CoV-2 is, the virus that we are targeting, uh, that we are going to, that we are targeting and that is uh, responsible for this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. So you all know now that uh, this pandemic of COVID-19 is due to the family of uh, coronaviruses. No? Uh, SARS-CoV-2 belongs to the large group of coronaviruses, which is an envelope positive strand RNA virus infecting mammals and birds. There are four genera, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma, and it's the alpha and beta coronavirus that infects, uh, that infect humans. And <clears throat> this human coronavirus primarily are respiratory pathogens. So they affect the respiratory epithelium, and, which is why the four uh, human coronavirus that are endemic globally are the ones that account for 10 to 30% of upper respiratory tract infection in adults. Uh, simply speaking, these uh, four endemic coronaviruses are the ones that are causing our common cold. While then new or newly emerged coronaviruses uh, that also fall under this large family is the beta coronaviruses. So that was that is the SARS, MERS, and now the newly identified SARS-CoV-2. 
So the SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded envelope RNA virus, and as I've mentioned, it's a beta coronavirus belonging to group 2B. And genetic sequences have shown that it is 80% identical to SARS-CoV, SARS coronavirus and 50% identical to the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. So SARS-CoV-2 is the seventh member of the coronavirus family that has infected humans. And it has been shown uh, that uh, it is most likely also that SARS-CoV-2 originated from bats because of these uh, identical sequences with SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. And mammals is the most likely link to humans. And as you all know, if we review SARS-CoV-2 was transmitted from bats to C civet cats to humans, while MERS-CoV was transmitted by camels to humans. And uh, the uh, endemic area for MERS-CoV is uh, the Middle East. That's why, that's why it's called Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Okay. And uh, it is also this identical, this uh, affinity of the SARS-CoV-2 to SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV which led to the use of the broad antiviral drugs that we are uh, investigating now and that is being tried for SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this... Let me just... This virus targets cells to the viral structural spike S protein here you see that binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2 receptor. This uh, spike glycoprotein around the virion is what gives it the picture of uh, corona. So that's the, our virus. Now, uh, before I discuss this uh, viral life cycle, and the potential drug targets, including the pharmacology of the drugs. Let's review first the uh, case classification for surveillance that uh, we are following. So uh, as you all know, we use the terms PUM, PUI at the start of the uh, pandemic, but this has now been uh, reclassified and we now call PUMs as the asymptomatic contacts and PUIs as either suspect or probable. And those that have already uh, confirmed laboratory tests, confirmed SARS-CoV-2 by PCR are classified as confirmed cases. So just to remind us that even if we are seeing a flattening of the number of cases and that we're probably moving, we're going to relax the uh, uh, quarantine measures. It doesn't mean that we have zero cases already. So we still have to be astute and we st still have to have a high index of suspicion. We still have to continue to implement the uh, expanded uh, SARI surveillance. So the suspect case, just to review, is all SARI cases where no other etiology fully explains the clinical presentation. So SARI here is severe acute respiratory illness, or uh, a suspect case can be an influenza-like illness with no other etiology again that will fully explain the clinical presentation. With history of travel or residence in an area that reported local transmission of COVID-19 disease during the 14 days prior to symptom onset or those with contact to a confirmed or probable case of COVID-19 disease again during the 14 days prior to symptom onset. And then uh, we also consider as a suspect for COVID individuals with fever or cough or shortness of breath or other respiratory signs or symptoms fulfilling any conditions. Those who are elderly with a comorbid with high risk pregnancy or a healthcare worker. Now, how do we define a contact? A contact is a person who experienced any of the following exposure during the two days before 
or 14 days after the onset of symptoms of a probable or confirmed case. And this includes face-to-face -face contact within one meter for more than 15 minutes, or direct physical contact with a probable or confirmed case, or direct, direct care for a patient with a probable or confirmed COVID case. For confirmed asymptomatic cases, the period of contact is measured as two days before through the 14 days after the date on which the sample was taken, leading to the confirmation. Okay. Well, probable are suspect cases whom testing for COVID-19 is inconclusive, either because the sample is not enough or is not properly collected, or uh, the sample was taken too early so that the test the virus, viral particles still could not be well determined. Or persons who underwent testing for COVID-19 but not con conducted in national or subnational reference lab or an officially credited COVID-19 lab for confirmatory testing. Or a suspect case for whom testing could not be performed for any reason or due to uh, uh, lack of access to the test. So that's a probable case. While again, a confirmed case is any individual who has a laboratory confirmed COVID-19 regardless of whether they have clinical signs or symptoms. And it has to be conducted at a national reference lab or an accredited laboratory. So that's the uh, case classification that we follow uh, and that is the prescribed classification also by the Department of Health, which we use for surveillance. Now for management, we have our clinical classification of patients who are sus present with either sus sus suspect, probable, or confirmed COVID-19. So based on their presentation at the ER and then uh, upon testing, so any patient or, uh, without respiratory distress will be classified as mild pneumonia. And then moderate uh, COVID are adults, the elderly with stable or unstable comorbid diseases and pneumonia, while severe are those with se presenting with severe pneumonia, res respiratory distress, high-risk pneumonia, Sep severe sepsis or septic shock. And those that uh, proceed to develop adult respiratory distress syndrome are the ones that we classify as uh, critical. And I uh, added here the field health classification to remind everyone on what you have to put in the charts you know, of your patients for them to be able to avail of our the field health uh, benefit package for COVID-19. So again, uh, field health covers both probable and confirmed cases of COVID. Okay. Now, uh, what's the uh, management now for mild, moderate, severe, and clinical and critical COVID? So the cornerstone of treatment for this uh, different severities of illness remains to be best supportive care. And what is best supportive care? It's symptomatic treatment, like giving paracetamol for fever, hydration. If there's concomitant bacterial pneumonia, when, then we give the appropriate antibiotics based on our uh, national guidelines developed also by the society, by PISMID. If uh, you also, there is concomitant influenza, then you may give oseltamivir. Now for our patients who develop severe, who progress to severe or the critical stage, then intensive respiratory management, intensive care support in the ICU is very important. And you've heard the other week, our uh, expert pulmonologist who shared with you how to uh, manage COVID pneumonia. Okay, 
So across all severities, you have to give best supportive care. And then for uh, uh, severe and critical patients, that's when uh, our pulmonologists come in. And uh, just to review the symptoms, and you all know that 80% of cases actually present as mild illness with fever, cough, sore throat. Some will have uh, loss of taste and smell. Some will present with diarrhea. And this is usually during the first three to five days. No? This is the critical period, the first uh, week, no? the drugs that are being compared against the standard of care. So these are the clinical trials. While this curve arrows here shows the number of trials, which are non-comparative. So to date, there are actually 500 clinical trials ongoing uh, in various uh, clinical trial registries. So you can see that uh, there is really a high activity among the researchers trying to find uh, the drug that would give us the cure that will potent that will help us stop this pandemic. So I've listed down here the investigational treatments for COVID-19 and classified them into two: the antivirals, chloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, remdesivir, and famipiravir, and the immunomodulators, tocilizumab. IVIG, convalescent plasma, and steroids. Uh, for this afternoon, I'll just focus on the antiviral agents. Okay. We probably, can probably have another session for the immunomodulator. Okay, so let's uh, go back to this uh, diagram. Let's review the viral life cycle, how the virus enters the cell and multiplies as this uh, diagram will show us also the potential drug targets. Okay. So the entry of the virus into the cell is facil facilitated by the two receptors, the ACE2 receptor and the TMPRSS2 receptor. Okay. Then upon entry of the uh, virion into the cell, there is uncoating and translation that happens. There is a protein synthesis that occurs, facilitated by these uh, polypeptides. And then the viral replication is facilitated by RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This then leads to a synthesis of struct structural proteins leading to the uh, Replication, the virus has to replicate into a cell for it to uh, manifest uh, symptoms. And then there is also this part where the immune system gets activated, resulting into a cytokine storm, which is why uh, there we have these immunomodulators here. Okay. So let's start off with... Uh, Chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, which is the most uh, studied drug. And uh, if we look at its mechanism of action, it inhibits viral entry and endocytosis by multiple mechanisms, as well as by host immunomodulatory effects. So we all know that chloroquine and is an anti-malarial drug and a very effective anti-malarial drug. And hydroxychloroquine, which is its analog, is used to treat uh, SLE and rheumatoid arthritis. Between the two, it's hydroxychloroquine that has uh, less, less toxicity, less propensity to prolong the QTC interval, and it has fewer drug-drug interactions than chloroquine. And uh, again, just to uh, review the proposed mechanism of action of why chloroquine and hydro hydroxychloroquine is being tried by and uh, used by researchers. So it 
increases the endosomal pH, inhibiting fusion of the SARS-CoV-2 and the host cell membrane. It, the, it also inhibits glycosylation of the cellular ACE2 receptor, and which may interfere with binding of the SARS-CoV to the cell receptor. So it in, essentially inhibits the viral entry. It blocks the transport of SARS-CoV-2 from early endosomes to endolysosomes, which may be required for the release of the viral genome. And uh, several in vitro studies have demonstrated in vitro activity of chloroquine against uh, SARS-CoV, which uh, provides the rationale why uh, this has been used in clinical trials. And as my, I mentioned, it also has immunomodulatory effects by inhibiting cytokine production, autophagy, and lysosomal activity in the host cell. Okay. So what's the clinical data as far as uh, met chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine is uh, concerned? Okay. So we have this uh, rapid reviews on Interventions for COVID-19 Management, which is uh, an initiative by the Institute of Clinical Epidemiology and the Asia-Pacific Center for Evidence-Based Care, headed by Dr. Adan. So um, I'd like just to uh, thank them. These are our students uh, and graduates of clinical epidemiology who volunteered to review the voluminous evidence that's coming out of, uh, with regards to COVID-19. So they helped us synthesize and critically appraise the evidence for drugs, diagnostic tests, adjunctive treatment. And this is available at the PISMID website. So you can access the uh, rapid reviews there. So for going back to for chloroquine, there are a lot of case theories and observational studies that have come out with regards to chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And of course, uh, you all know that there are conflicting results as well. And uh, this, uh, we look part at particularly at the published randomized controlled trials. There are two RCTs uh, that were conducted in China and uh, these two are a meta analysis of these two RCT showed that hydroxychloroquine uh, resulted in improvement in the chest CT scan. Okay. With, however, this improvement in the CT scan findings did not result or translate into a positive clinical outcomes. We did not see any effect on disease pro progression or symptom improvement as far as chloroquine is concerned or hydroxychloroquine in these two published RCTs. Okay. So to date, the clinical data on the use of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine have been mostly from patients with mild and some cases of moderate disease. And we have very limited data on severe and critical COVID-19. There is a lot of ongoing RCTs. There are 19 on HCQ or chloroquine as treatment for viral, that's lopinavir. Okay. So lopinavir inhibits the protein synthesis. No? Uh, specifically, it inhibits three chymotrypsin-like protease. So, the replication of SARS-CoV-2 depends on the cleavage of polyproteins into an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and helicase. So, the enzymes responsible for this cleavage are two proteases, the three chymotrypsin-like protease and papain-like protease. So, as I mentioned, lop lopirito inhibits this uh, SARS-CoV-3 chymotrypsin-like protease. Uh, although it has shown activity against SARS-CoV, it has poor selectivity index, indicating that 
higher than toler tolerable levels of the drug might be required to achieve meaningful inhibition in vivo. And it is also excreted in the GI tract, thus coronavirus-infected enterocytes might be exposed to higher concentrations of the drug. Okay, so Lopirito is a combination drug used primarily in HIV. So as you all know, lopinavir is the protease inhibitor while ritonavir increases the concentration of lopinavir. And patients with SARS treated with lopinavir, ritonavir appear to reduce the viral load. And uh, lopinavir, ritonavir was re recommended for patients with mers -Co. So this was the rationale why they are now trying lopirito also for SARS-CoV-2. And again, case reports have shown that it may be beneficial. And there are also some studies that show that it can decrease the duration of viral shedding if administered early. However, uh, two open label RCTs did not show significant improvement, did not reduce mortality, or it did not also decrease the viral shedding in patients with COVID-19. And these are the most common adverse events, nausea, vomiting, headache, in hypercholesterolemia, and hypertriglyceridemia. And there are also at least 16 ongoing clinical trials on Lopirito, including the WHO Solidarity Trial. The US NIH panel specifically recommends against the use of lopirito for or other HIV protease inhibitors for the treatment of COVID-19, except in the context of a clinical trial. And the reason for that is because of the pharmacodynamics of HIV protease inhibitors, which do not support its therapeutic use for COVID-19. WHO interim guidance does not recommend any specific antiviral or biologic agents, and it only recommends symptomatic treatment for patients with COVID-19. While China recommends, suggests the use of lopirito in COVID-19. In Pismid, we recommended it as an alternative if uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine is not possible to give, but also with the caution that it can also prolong QTC and elevate, uh, cause elevation of AST and ALT. So here. Now this is the uh, updated recommendation that uh, will come out in when we update our guidelines in the next following week. Okay, we hope to be able to come up with an updated guidelines because of the evolving uh, data that has come out. And this is what will come out in the new guide, updated guidelines, that there is insufficient evidence to support the routine use of low-period COVID-19 infection based on two good quality RCTs with inconclusive evidence on clinical improvement, 28-day mortality, and viral shedding among treated patients with mild to moderate, mild to severe COVID-19. Okay. Now let's move to an, uh, another antiviral that's remdesivir here. So it, remdesivir inhibits uh, viral replication and specifically RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So it's an Remdesivir is an IV investigational nucleotide prodrug of an adenosine analog, which has demonstrated in vitro activity against SARS-CoV-2, in vitro and in vivo, and against SARS and MERS. And you also know that this uh, drug was also tried during the e Ebola epidemic, and it has not been shown to work. So rem remdesivir binds to the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase, inhibiting viral replication through premature termination of RNA transcription. So it uh, inhibits vi viral synthesis. Okay. So what's the uh, evidence behind uh, remdesivir? 
So there's one small RCT done in China on 237 patients with severe COVID-19, uh, which was uh, prema stopped prematurely because they are unable to enroll patients already. And this trial did not show any benefit in clinical improvement and mortality. While a case series of compassionate use of uh, remdesivir in 61 patients from nine countries showed a mortality rate of 13%, improved the need for oxygen support and clinical improvement. However, it was associated with serious adverse events which led to discontinuation of the study. Uh, and of course, since it is a case series, so the findings here the positive findings needs to be confirmed in a clinical trial. And currently there are 13 clinical trials, including seven ongoing RCTs and two suspended RCTs. And as you all know, uh, I think it's last week that uh, there are some positive findings from two large RCTs that were conducted in the US NIH. So, these large RCTs, the first one compared against placebo, and the other one compared a five-day versus 10-day course of uh, remdesivir. And these positive findings uh, in terms of clinical benefits was the, used as the basis for the US FDA's issuing an emergency use authorization for remdesivir. Okay, so is it, Really now the wonder drug, have we found the magic bullet or is it just a helpful drug? So there, some, there are articles stating that there should be a cautious optimism with regards to the findings of this uh, large RCT until we see the publication, okay. So uh, What's the status as far as uh, the evidence for remdesivir is? So as uh, I mentioned earlier, there was one RCT and uh, case series and which showed no clear benefit in terms of clinical improvement and mortality. But we are waiting from, for this emerging evidence from two large RCTs which are pending publication. Uh, as uh, USNIH said, the preliminary results indicate that patients who receive remdesivir had 31% faster time to recovery than those who receive placebo. And specifically, the median time to recovery was 11 days for those who receive remdesivir compared to 15 days for those who receive placebo. And they also said that the results are suggesting a survival benefit with a mortality rate of 8% for the group receiving remdesivir versus 11.6% for the placebo group. Uh, we eagerly await the uh, full paper so that we can critically appraise the uh, trial and see whether uh, which groups of patients really would benefit from remdesivir and whether it is just a single drug that would be uh, the magic drug that will kill the virus, whether it's just a monotherapy that would be effective in clearing the virus. So we await the article to help to decide whether is it a helpful drug or a wonder drug. So this is just uh, the dosage for remdesivir. So it's uh, given IV. 200 milligrams on day one, followed by 100 milligrams per day for 10 days, infused over 30 to 60 minutes. And then the, probably the newest kid on the block is uh, Fabipiravir. It's the lesser known among all these antivirals. Uh, it's a pro-drug of a purine nucleotide, and it inhibits RNA polymerase also halting viral replication. And preclinical data are derived from its influenza and Ebola activity. And it also has a broad activity against other RNA viruses. There are currently nine ongoing clinical trials on Fabipiravir, six in China, 
two in Japan, one in Thailand. And results are expected to be out between April to October 2020. Uh, we are actually also uh, participating in uh, one the uh, Jap Japan trial. So Dr. Bear Dr. Berba or Nina Berba is the one leading the uh, trial in the Philippines. Although it's a small trial, it will only include a hundred patients for the Philippines. Okay. It's Fabipiravir compared against uh, standard of care. And what's the existing evidence? There's one RCT which compared Fabipiravir to Arbidol which is another antiviral drug, uh, which did not show significant differences in clinical recovery for patients with moderate to severe COVID-19 infections. And another non-randomized open-label trial showed that pavipiravir reduced viral clearance with higher chest CT scan improvement rates compared to lopirito in patients with non-severe COVID-19. However, these two studies have serious methodologic issues and results should be interpreted with caution. So again, there is still insufficient evidence to recommend Fabipiravir for COVID-19. So again, uh, for the full reviews, you can access them at the PISMID website, the Rapid Evidence Reviews, and uh, we are also currently updating the guidelines and we're working with uh, PCP. We are also inviting our pulmonologist PCCP to uh, share in the pulmonary management part of the guidelines as well as uh, possibly hematology to contribute on the immunomodulators and as well as rheumatology. So watch out for our updated guidelines. Okay. Currently, this is what we have just to summarize. Uh, the clinical management of COVID-19. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, we classify them into mild, moderate, or severe, depending on their clinical presentation, whether they have signs of respiratory distress, or sepsis, or and whether they are elderly or with a comorbid condition. So the mild and low risk, they can be managed at home, best supporting care. Moderate, severe, and high risk are the ones that we admit. And uh, these are the investigational drugs uh, that we offer. But we always stated that they have, we have to explain the risk-benefit ratio and that we need to get informed consent before using these investigational drugs. So what is the landscape of treatment? So at this time, there are still no medical therapies that have been definite, that have definitively shown to improve outcomes in patients with COVID-19. So we have no drug that has been really uh, approved. No? So there is no effective antiviral therapy at this time. And as uh, you've seen in the discussion, a number of drugs have demonstrated in vitro activity against SARS-CoV-2 or potential clinical benefits in observational or small non-randomized studies. So uh, which actually uh, raised optimism no? when these uh, studies or small, this case series, observational studies showing some uh, benefits. But we all know the limitations of uh, observational studies and case series without uh, a control group. So we really do not know if uh, it's the drug that uh, resulted in the clinical benefit or it's the uh, host factor. It's or is it a combination of drugs, combination of interventions that contributed to the clearance of the virus or to the improvement of the patient? So therefore, we still really need adequately powered randomized clinical trials to establish the efficacy of these antiviral drugs. And 
fortunately, we do have now these large tri ongoing trials to address this uh, clinical equipoise no, on are these antiviral drugs really beneficial? As you can see, probably you are all in a dilemma on whether should I give this drug, even if my patient is just a mild case or not. So let's uh, wait for the results of these three big trials, the WHO Solidarity Trial, the ACT Trial, which is the outpatient trial. And then this is the uh, adaptive coronavirus clinical trial of USNIH on remdesivir, which we are awaiting publication. So what are the limitations of uh, these repurposed drugs? We have to understand, no? These uh, antiviral drugs, which were repurposed, no? So for, they are being used for other indications and are being tried for COVID-19. Uh, this, uh, the use of this repurposed drug relies on the assumption that the benefits you know, that we see in vitro and in the uh, uh, case series will outweigh the associated risk. So one limitation to using repurposed agents is the propensity of these agents to cause acute toxicity. This acute toxicity may outweigh the undefined benefit of a specific antiviral agent and Augmented toxicity with combination therapy, such as heart or liver toxicity, creates potential additional risk and the need for a close risk versus benefit analysis. So that's why we really need to uh, assess our patient and explain to the patient, determine uh, what way the benefits and the risk of using these repurposed drugs. So overall, the positive of evidence demonstrating a clear benefit may not justify the risk of the repurposed agent. So depending on uh, the characteristics or the comorbid conditions of your patient and their severity of the illness, then you have to weigh the uh, evidence, or weigh the risk-benefit ratio. And this is also of utmost concern in patients at high risk for toxicity and in situations where adverse events may preclude entry into investigational trials. The other question is, uh, should I just give supportive care or should I enroll the patient in a clinical trial? The priority is to enroll the patient in a clinical trial. If they qualify, okay. and if they do not have the uh, contraindications that may con con cause harm to the patient. Okay. So if it is not possible, patients who are stable as an outpatient or have no evidence of oxygen requirements or pneumonia by evaging, they can generally be managed with supportive care alone. Patients who have evidence of hypoxia or pneumonia, especially those with risk factors for disease progression, such as those, the elderly, those with cardiac or pulmonary comorbidities, diabetes, immunosuppression, they can be considered for specific COVID-19 therapy after discussing the risk and benefits with the patient and in accordance with local hospital treatment guidelines. So it's very important to get an informed consent. So uh, initially, when we came up with the PISMID guidelines, we did not have uh, clinical trials on board yet in the country. So we gave guidance on how to use uh, chloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, and even tocilizumab. And we emphasize that, again, we have to weigh the benefits and the risk and explain this to the patient and get informed consent to decide whether you will just give support supportive care or you will use uh, this off-label drugs uh, in as a compassionate use or for expanded use. 
So this uh, brings us now to the uh, WHO solidarity trial. So now that we have this trial in the country, this is the uh, an international study of treatments for COVID-19 in hospitalized patients. Uh, there is now the option for the clinician to enroll the patient into the clinical trial rather than just uh, outright giving chloroquine, lopinavir, or tocilizumab. I think uh, it's, uh, it would be a benefit to science if we are able to contribute you know, to this clinical trial to be able to answer the question on which antiviral treatments are effective for COVID-19. So this uh, large RCT compares antiviral agents against local standard of care. And the main objective is to provide reliable estimates of these antiviral treatments on in-hospital mortality. So the main outcome is mortality and the secondary objectives are to assess the effects of these antivirals on duration of hospital stay, uh, receipt of ventilation or intensive care. If efficacious, large numbers of deaths could be avoided by one or more of these antiviral treatments, but the benefits can only be reliably docu documented by a large randomized trial. As uh, you've seen earlier in the evidence reviews that we did, all the trials are underpowered to show really clear benefits, which is why it's important now to really uh, come up with a well ad adequately powered RCT to answer this important question on the effectiveness of antiviral treatments. So in this trial, adults are randomized. Okay, so this is the inclusion criteria recently hospitalized or already in the hospital for COVID-19 with informed consent and they will be allocated to any of these uh, five treatments. So standard of care, usual standard of care in the hospital. So in our country, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's just supportive treatment. That's the standard of care. No? Uh, all the other drugs are not considered standard of care. They were just approved for off-label use. Then remdesivir, we, we now have the shipment from WHO has arrived. So we have remdesivir already as part of the uh, treatment arm. Then we have lopinavir, We do not have interferon yet, but we have chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. So we uh, you have a patient that's uh, hospitalized and with probable or definite COVID-19 or de probable or confirmed COVID-19, then uh, you can consider them for enrollment into this trial. Uh, again, just have to assess them if they have any contraindications that to any of these drugs that will uh, preclude their entry or their inclusion into the trial. So for our country, we are we have four arms, uh, the standard of care, remdesivir, lopinavir, etonavir, and chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. We do not have yet the interferon. Okay. And uh, enrollment in, and randomization is done electronically. So to minimize exposure, and these are the data that are collected to, uh, for analysis. Okay. So the trial has an adaptive design. So what is an adaptive design? Additional treatments may be added while the trial is in progress, depending on the uh, uh, evidence. So the therapeutic committee is the one that reviews uh, evidence as they come out. And uh, interim analysis is also done by an independent global data and, sa data and safety monitoring committee. As the uh, patients are enrolled, the numbers uh, are, as the numbers are rich, or there is a 
pre-identified the point at which they would do an, an interim analysis, then they will decide on whether to continue or discontinue one arm or to add additional treatments. So currently, WHO is looking, still evaluating if pabipiravir or tocilizumab will be added into the uh, trial. And uh, there will be a meeting this evening also to discuss on whether the impact of remdesivir, uh, the results of uh, the NIH trial on remdesivir, what will be the impact of that in the, with regards to this uh, solidarity trial. Okay. Uh, this uh, trial also has simplified, simplified the procedures you know, so that uh, because it, we are in a pandemic situation, so the procedures are simplified and made easy for the trialists, those who are collecting the data. Okay. The numbers to be randomized. So the larger the numbers enter, the more accurate the results will be. Uh, but the numbers that can be entered will, of course, depend on how large this epidemic how becomes. No, uh, depends on how long this epidemic will be with us. Okay. So if substantial numbers get hospitalized in the participating centers, then it's possible to enter several thousand hospitalized patients admit, admitted with relatively mild disease and a few thousand with severe disease. So the beauty of having a large trial is you can uh, see the effect of the drug across uh, the different severities of illness, so from mild to critical to severe. And at this time, the appropriate sample size could not be estimated as the start of the trial and would depend on the evolution of the pandemic. Okay. <clears throat> and then the other reason for entering large number of patients into the trial is so that the natural history of the disease or the response to certain treatments may, may differ substantially between different populations or subpopulations. Uh, patients with particular prior conditions, older patients, patients in one or another large country. So you have a variable population and you can do subgroup analysis depending on these uh, different factors to see if uh, the effect of the drug is influenced by these different uh, factors. So as I mentioned if sufficient numbers are randomized, then it's possible to obtain uh, statistically re reliable treatment comparisons within each of several con different countries or types of patients. Okay, so the randomization is a, on a one is to one is to one basis. Okay. And then, as I mentioned, the primary analysis is on all costs in hospital mortality. So this is the primary outcome. Secondary outcomes that will be analyzed, duration of hospitalization, use of ventilation or intensive care. And uh, this is an adaptive design. No specific sample size is specified in this public health emergency core protocol. And although it's interim analysis will be kept under review by an independent global data safety monitoring committee. It is anticipated that at least several thousands will be included into the trial. So again, the numbers will depend on how large the epidemic becomes. So as I said, so the adapt, it's adaptive because uh, they've set uh, time points on when interim analysis can be done and treatment arms will have, may be modified. So it's for this trial, uh, <clears throat> so WHO and the Department of Health are the co-sponsors. WHO provides the drugs and uh, the Department of Science and Technology, PCHRD, uh, funded the clinical trial operations in our country. Okay. 
So there are 24 sites in the Philippines participating uh, in this trial, nine government hospitals. So this, uh, those who are actively recruiting already with IRB approvals are Lung Center of the Philippines and PGH, RITM and San Lazaro and Southern Philippines Medical Center in Davao just recently had their IRB approvals and hopefully you will start recruiting patients already. And then we have 15 private hospitals uh, participating also in the trial. Asian Hospital Cardinal Santos, uh, Makati Med, and St. Luke's Medical Center Global, and QC Medical City, UERM, are actively recruiting already. The rest uh, have just had their IRB approvals, so Chinese General Hospital, the demand doctors, MDH, Manila Doctors, Manila Med. Manila Med has also contributed already. Okay. The rest are still waiting for IRB approval. So we started recruiting patients. Uh, so globally, the trial started in March 22. And these are the countries that are uh, contributing already to the trial. So the France, Norway, Spain, Brazil, Iran, Switzerland, Peru. And then in Asia, we have Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, Honduras, and India. So there are more than 1,500 patients already have been uh, entered into the trial. This is as of April 29. Okay. So these are the countries that have been contributing. And uh, there. The cumulative number of patients recruited is now 1,877. This is April 29, so this is this has probably reached already uh, the 2,000 mark by this time. Okay, and as of today, we have 63 enrolled patients, and these are the. Uh, hospitals that have been contributing to the uh, trial and these are the number of patients that we are en able to enroll per day. So we hope to be able to contribute more and at the same time, more importantly, contribute to science, contribute to knowledge, as, uh, to help us find the, the answer whether these antiviral drugs that we are using are really effective or not. So this is not a race against each other, but a race against time to find the effective drug that will uh, hopefully end this pandemic. So with that, thank you for your attention. And I thank also all the participants in the solidarity trial. And I encourage our clinicians to please enroll encourage our patients to enroll into this clinical trial. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isa. And um, we we have a number of questions, Isa. No? So let me start off, and I think Raymond is also collecting some of the some of the questions. But first, thank you so much for that presentation. I think people have been um, hungry for information, for finding out just how exactly to treat uh, COVID. So let me read some of the questions here. So one of the questions is, what is the role of zinc with um, uh, hydroxychloroquine? This is from Merle de la Cruz. Okay. Uh, zinc is an immune supplement. So thank you for the question. But whether they zinc has a direct uh, action against the drug, there's no evidence to show that. And whether they have an interaction we also do not know. So uh, there's really no there's no clinical trial yet that has uh, looked at hydroxychloroquine plus zinc. Uh, what is the uh, effect of zinc on hydro hydroxychloroquine? What we know about zinc is that it's an immune uh, booster. Okay, so it boosts the immune system. It 
it's helpful in respiratory infections. Okay. So it's a adjunctive treatment. Okay. okay, thank you. One more question before uh, Raymond goes into the assessment. Um, this is from Jacqueline Risa San Gabriel. How frequently would you should you use an ECG if you're using hydrochloroquine uh, on a patient? Well, baseline, and then uh, if in the clinical trial, what we do is uh, after we give the loading dose, we do a repeat of the uh, ECG. Then if the patient does not have any of the uh, contraindications or risk factors like uh, heart disease, no comorbidities, then we at the end, at the middle of treatment and at the end would be uh, sufficient. Okay, we have one more question from Edwin. Um, should we treat mild cases with azithromycin and hydrochloroquine so that this doesn't progress to uh, moderate or severe pneumonia? The evidence for hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin is insufficient for now to recommend the use of this uh, combination. The small clinical trial that showed some benefit is actually has a lot of uh, methodologic flaws. So we do not recommend routine use of hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. Plus there is, as I mentioned now, a large RCT also, an adaptive design that the country will participate on. So this uh, is led by Dr. Palileo and Tony Dance. So I think uh, our isolation facilities for mild cases will be the ones that will be recruited for participation into this trial. For So it's, CQ, it's chloroquine plus azithromycin versus standard of care. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, Raymond, you want to talk about yes. the... Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Susie and uh, Ma'am Isa. Uh, Ma'am Isa, that was a wonderful presentation. Po. Learned a lot about the solidarity trial po and the current efforts uh, for a clinical trial here that the Philippines is involved with. Uh, for our attendees, po, we have uh, in your screen yung pong poll po natin. Uh, an assessment or evaluation of uh, the presentation that was given. The first one says uh, the presenter demonstrated thorough knowledge of the webinar topic. And then the second one is uh, the presenter was well prepared and organized. The uh, third one, presenter spoke clearly and audibly. The fourth one, the presenter used appropriate language with technical medical jargons adequately explained. And the fifth one, the presenter used appropriate workshop training webinar techniques. So for all of the questions, po, no, uh, most of our, so a majority of our attendees po, uh, responded with strongly agree. So it was really well received, po, uh, Dr. Alejandria. So in terms of the composition of our um, attendees, we had, I think, around uh, uh, nearly 300 attendees for this webinar uh, comprise uh, of attendees from the following countries, the Philippines, the United States, uh, Canada, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, from the Philippines, we have attendees from Baguio City, Los Baños, Laguna, Lahug, Cebu, Puerto Princesa, Palawan, Santiago City, Isabela, South Cotabato, even from the Boracay Island and Malaybalay, Bukidnon and Sariaya Quezon. Uh, institutions naman po, uh, represented, uh, the World Health Organization, Philippine Country Office, uh, the Department of Health of Central Luzon, uh, from the Academy Xavier University, Ateneo de Cagayan, School of Medicine, Vicente Soto Memorial Medical Center, San Antonio City of Iligan Hospital, uh, Farmers Medical Center from Ormoc, the Long Center of the Philippines, and of course, from the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. So I think, uh, so nasimulan na rin po no, ni um, Dr. Susi. Uh, the questions that we will be tackling and I think there will be questions that will be flashed on the screen if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the ones that have been mentioned here, po, uh, so I'm going through the Q&A list here. Raymond, this first one by Charmaine hasn't been answered yet. So, uh, Isa, symptomatic patients with pending results are classified as suspect or they moved over to probable once a test has been done? Okay. Uh, 
they move to probable if okay. the result is inconclusive. Okay. However, if it's pending, then it's You're still, still yeah, I, I suspect pa din. Okay, next question, please. So, okay, we'll go to the question box. Um, Opa. How about this one from Dian Nasino, uh, Dr. Susie? Is it possible to use radiotherapy to kill intrapulmonary COVID-19 to stop its effect in destroying the lungs? Uh, I think this is not advisable to do radiotherapy because you will not, you, there's a potential to damage not just the lungs. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, there's another question here. What treatment can be given to uh, confirmed positive pregnant patients? Confirmed positive pregnant. Well, supportive care is still the, as I said, the uh, cornerstone of treatment. We have to give supportive care. If you're referring to drugs, then for pregnant, uh, I would not advise to okay. give. Okay. Um, okay. There was another question, Dr. Isa, uh, that was flashed on the screen. It was mostly po, no, how, how the hospitals, or let's say yung mga doctors po, will be able to enroll their, there we go. Will hospitals per region of the country be involved in the solidarity trial? Is this for confirmed cases or will you include probables? And also, uh, maybe you could repeat po, Ma'am Isa, uh, how do we, how to enroll po yung mga patients in the solidarity trial, Ma'am? Okay. Uh, before I answer that, I'll just go back to the question earlier on the suspect and probable. No? Uh, that's for surveillance purposes. No? Yung it depends on the test result. Now, for clinical management, if the result is still pending but the patient is clinically COVID, you think the patient is clinically COVID, then you continue the management as a probable or the clinical COVID. Okay. Now, the question here on uh, whether we include confirmed or probable cases. So for solidarity trial, we are allowed to include probable cases and our criteria for probable case is patients presenting with fever or respiratory symptoms and a CBC result which shows either lymphopenia or leukopenia and a chest x-ray which shows uh, pneumonia. So they can be included. Now for the hospitals, so we have uh, the Davao hospital that's included is SPMC and then for Cebu, Vicente Soto. Then uh, Baguio Gen in the north, in the south we have Batangas Medical Center. Uh, uh, so far, th those are the hospitals that are able to enroll that will be able to enroll patients in the regions. Okay. The rest are in NCR. Okay. So there's a question here from Joel: Is Remdesivir available in the country or? And it's currently being used in PGH and only for treatment centers or only for clinical trials? It's only for clinical trial use for now. Okay. Next question, please. Next question, Paul. Okay. Um, okay. I'll read from the, from the list. Um, what management or what's, okay, what specific off-label, medicines off-label or not have been shown to be effective and most superior in healing? Or considered successful in our country. So I think this is a question about uh, what's the experience now outside of the outside of the clinical trials. What seem to be the the uh, treatments that are working, even if the the drugs are off label, from uh, from the experience. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think we still have to really analyze our data. No? So the patients that we have given chloroquine, lopinavir. Ocilizumab. That's uh, a research that needs to be done by all of us here. So like uh, I know Philippine Rheumatology Association has uh, uh, is starting on a protocol to describe the experience with the use of tocilizumab. In PGH, we are also gathering data to look at the, the outcomes of the patients that receive these drugs. And it will actually be 
very good if all the hospitals will be able to share data so that we can really we can pull our data and analyze all these patients that we have given uh, investigation of drugs, which one really uh, seem to be effective, even though it's observational. If we have a lot to analyze, if we have a lot, a big number, then we can do a, a logistic regression analysis to control for those confounders while yeah. waiting for these uh, big trials to also come up come out with their results. Yeah, thank you for that, Isa. In fact, I think uh, what we're proposing in PhilHealth is that uh, PhilHealth be involved in supporting um, patients that are going to be enrolled in the trial because I understand what's going to be paid for is only the drugs. Am I correct? So uh, also, mm -hmm. uh, because there will be reimbursement, I think we could solve some way that uh, the patients that are being reimbursed through PhilHealth that are in the trial are actually producing or not even in the trial, but using observational data should be able to give you uh, more data points to analyze. So we'll talk about that offline, but I do believe that PhilHealth should be more involved now in the investigational um, track. Uh, okay, so another question, does hemoperfusion play a role in the management of COVID patients? When this, okay. Actually, there is another question, Dr. Susie, which uh, I think might be helpful po, no? So it is about the compassionate use of the drugs. So, ma'am, if if the if the patient po, doctor doctor Isa, yeah. uh, um, if the patient po uh, is not part of the solidarity trial but would want to parang gain access to the drugs po ba quote unquote uh, will apply for compassionate use be allowed that that sort of thing, ma'am? Yeah. yeah, currently, uh, before the trials came out we are able to use uh, these drugs for compassionate use, except for remdesivir because it's really not available in the country. So it, remdesivir is only under uh, clinical trial use. It, unless uh, FDA procures the drug, allows, uh, if we, unless we are able to procure the drug from Gilead for compassionate use. That's the only way we'll be able to have access. But for the other drugs, if uh, they don't qualify for the clinical trial or it's not offered, then uh, we do give them as compassionate use, again, explaining the risk and benefits to the patient and getting informed consent. Okay. Um, other questions to Mom Paul will be more about has Dr. Alejandria, has there been more frequencies in terms of dose adjustments for COVID patients uh, regarding any medications that they are taking for? And then will there be, as part of our effort, will there be a centralized database for all of the clinical trials that are being done here in the Philippines? Hmm. Uh, with regards to dose adjustments, Yes, we do adjust if uh, warranted based on the renal function of the patient. That's the question. Now, the registry, we're talking about registry. The other question is on registry, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Opo. Uh, we a centralized a repository, ma'am, for all of the ongoing clinical trials here in the Philippines related to COVID-19. Uh, what I know is that PCHRD requires us to register trials in their database, but I'm not sure if we have something really that captures all the trials that we have right now. I'm not sure if we have a centralized one. What I know is just the, uh, if it's, uh, if we apply for funding from PCHRD, we have to register it. And then okay. our respective universities, we have our registry. But no, I'm not sure yet if we really, I don't think we have a national registry. Okay. Um, for those who are interested in the hemoperfusion question, next Friday, so let's make this a Friday habit, no? Um, from 12 to 2, we'll, we'll have these clinicians talking about uh, COVID management. And uh, next week, we're going to have Dr. Elizabeth Montemayor, who is a, uh, a uh, nephrologist. 
and she will talk about COVID-19 and the kidneys. So just jot that down on your uh, jot that down on your schedule. Of course, I'll give you that announcement a little bit later. But she's um, UP College of Medicine professor and also uh, vice president of the nephrology Philippine Nephrology Society. So just for those who are interested, keep that in mind. Next Friday, we'll talk about that because there's there are lots of issues around uh, renal disease and and COVID. So. Um, I think there are a lot more questions here. Let me just pick up on on some, Isa. Of course, a lot of congratulations, and we want to join join everyone in congratulating you. I thought that was a really great uh, presentation, very uh, informative. Okay. Uh, is there evidence on association between severity of COVID-19 and the use of statins? Mm. Uh, well, I have not read... Uh, any uh, evidence or studies looking at association between COVID-19, severity, and statins. Okay. Some how about, yeah. Isa, how about the use of steroids uh, oh, for oh. your, you know, your, your kind of cytokine storms and all of those very severe inflammations? Uh, yeah. What, is our, what is the guidance on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the other set of... Uh, Investigational drugs or, well, uh, drugs that uh, should be discussed also. No? So the immunomodulator side, a uh, group of drugs to address the cytokine storm. Okay. So for steroids, there's actually uh, insufficient evidence also no, to recommend that the use of steroids. So there's different... Uh, there are variable uh, opinions with regards to the use of steroids. So it's a matter of timing also, you know, or whether to give it or not. For sepsis, it's uh, given among those who are in refractory shock. Okay. So we can probably have another session on immunomodulators. It's I know, all I know. I mean, there's so many, so many topics. Yeah. So many, many. <laughs> here uh this is this is a practical question again from jacqueline rice and gabriel how do you ensure avoid or minimize the risk of drug related problems especially patients in the ic who are taking their maintenance so pain relief agents antibiotics or other medications so this is a question about drug interactions in relation to uh the drugs that you're talking about yeah okay so of course, there has to be close monitoring no, on these patients. That's why, uh, if you think you really have to weigh the benefits and the risk, the risk for if the risk for toxicity is higher, then we don't advise giving the investigational drug. So there has to be closer monitoring. So monitoring blood chemistries, ASTALP, the kidney function has to be. Uh, closely, closely monitored, especially in the ICU. And the pharmacies, if you have your clinical pharmacies, they help also in monitoring, advising us on drug-drug interactions. Right. I think there are a couple of, a lot of questions here on uh, drug interaction, and maybe we'll, we'll do a separate session on drug interactions oh, because oh. this is a, a very common uh, question. A yeah, go yeah, ahead. Another question, Dr. Susi. Uh, I think a lot will be interested in po, no? So, any concern po among patients receiving ACE inhibitors for those who are COVID positive? Yeah. Again, there is no evidence no, that uh, it affects the, uh, that the use of ACE inhibitor will affect your uh, ability or your will increase your risk of getting COVID or will increase the severity of COVID. There's no data to show that. So it's not advised to stop your ACE inhibitors. Yeah. And take the ACE inhibitor. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> this is further from Dr. Is. Okay. Uh, Dr. Domingo just sent me a message that she needs to leave. But uh, Gigi, you want to say a few words before you leave? I will give you the floor. She has another meeting, but uh, she's been on the call and um, we're very grateful, of course, for field health support. Gigi, say a few words. 
Hello, and uh, thank you, Dr. Isa. That was very interesting to uh, listen to. Um, maraming ibang kailangan follow-up webinars dito with all the questions being asked. Uh, I just have to leave. I'm very sorry. And uh, thank you for all the participants. I have another uh, seminar, also a Zoom seminar with the uh, OFWs abroad. Uh, okay. We have to educate them, tell them all about the, the issues now. I, I'm sure you guys heard about that. But anyway, uh, thank you very much. And again, we're very happy to be part of this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gigi. Okay, another question for Isa. Uh, vitamin C, IV or oral or supplement for treatment, what is your take on that? Okay. Uh, IV, vitamin C, no sufficient evidence to give it as an adjunctive therapy. Oral vitamin C for supplement, that's all right. Yeah, drink a lot of calamansi juice, right? Yeah. But not IV. <laughs> not IV. Oh, not IV though. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have any other questions, Raymond? So I think, I think it was... I think, I think it was for the most part, uh, related po talaga. One of the clamors po, Dr. Susie and Dr. Isa, is mm -hmm. like a webinar on drug interactions po uh, okay. that would be helpful po for our pharmacists and anything that uh, would be, let's say, recommendations po that would be related. Or maybe something that's, ano po, that would highlight... Uh, all of the recommendations of peace mead, anything of that sort. Well, yeah, okay. Raymond, I just want to acknowledge that um, on our list, we have a number of pharmacists who are attending and medical technologists. So we just want to, to recognize everybody who's here on the webinar and some nurses as well. So we're all, you're all welcome and um, we're, we're, we're glad that you're on the webinar. Okay, so uh, Isa, how about the use of seasonal flu vaccine during these times of pandemic? It's Mario. <laughs> it's recommended to give oh. system flu vaccine. Yeah, it's expand a little bit more, Isa, because people are asking about the flu vaccine. Um, local governments want to buy for everybody. I was just asking um one of our colleagues, and they were saying we have to give it for everybody above the age of two years old. What is your your recommendation should be focusing on seniors. Is the cut of sixty? Is it fifty? What is it? Uh, our guidelines uh, for adults. It's uh, we lowered it after fifty and above. Fifty and above. Okay. And those with comorbid conditions, healthcare workers, we need uh, annual flu vaccine. System. Okay. Yeah. And then for children, two years old and above, it's recommended. Right, in a, in a smaller dose, no? Yes. Um, do, you want, do you have some more questions there on your side? Um, not really. I think we we should have covered everything. So we just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Isa for taking the time to answer those uh, questions. Po, no? And then but before we end this webinar, maybe we could flash the poll questions that we had earlier uh, and, get the right and get the answers directly from Dr. Alejandria. It, it, it's just a very simple lang naman po na set of questions. The first one is actually a yes or no, and then uh, the second one is uh, no, it's on the drugs. Opo. Can we can you flash that? Okay. So first question po, Dr. Isa, uh, you already mentioned this, pero <laughs> let's go ahead. Is the Philippines part of the Solidarity Trial launched by the World Health Organization to test the safety and effectiveness of possible therapies in treating COVID-19? Just to hear from you, ma'am, the, uh, the answer. <laughs> the answer is because of my yeah, it's not. Opa. Yes, ma'am. Opa, the number two po kasi is, ano, is uh, ano po yung drugs na hindi kasali. Uh, so, ito po yung makasali, remdesivir, uh, chloramine hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, reconavir. Niclosimide is not kasali po. Yung yeah. po ang, ang answers from uh, Dr. Alejandria. Okay, so as we come to a close for our webinar, we would like to thank this opportunity to thank our uh, resource speaker, Dr. Marisa Alejandria. Maraming salamat po ma'am for that uh, very informative session and for allowing us to learn more about the Philippines' participation, not just in our country's uh, effort in combating COVID-19, but also in our global participation po as a country in the Solidarity Trial. Uh, I will uh, I will ask um, Dr. Susi Marcado po to give uh, final words po uh, to close our session for today. Thank you, Dr. Susi. 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 Thank you, Dr. Susi
Okay, so Isa, thank you so much. We know you're busy. Uh, you know, Isa barely sleeps. She's advising the IATF. And as head of PISMID, there's so much work. But she found time to be with us. And we just want to thank you. If we could do a standing ovation and clapping, we would do it. But anyway, our, 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 uh, our sincere thanks, Isa, for your time and for sharing your knowledge. And I hope uh, someone has suggested that at some point, we should see some um, feedback or results of the clinical trials. Uh, <clears throat> there's interest in seeing what's going to happen as we progress. Next yeah. week, we're going to have Dr. Beth Elizabeth Montemayor, who is a nephrologist. The topic is COVID-19 and the kidneys. And that's uh, at 12 to 2 next week um, on Friday. Uh, and then um, I just want to thank the University of the Philippines uh, and of course, our partners in PhilHealth and everyone who's been on the webinar and everyone who's watching the playback. Maraming salamat po sa inyo. Um, stay safe um, and um, let's keep fighting COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Isa and Dr. Susie. Maraming salamat po. And hopefully, you'll be able, lahat po kayo, you'll be able to join us as we continue on with our regular Friday lunch date ano po, from 12 noon to 2 p.m. here in the UP PhilHealth webinar series, Stop COVID Deaths, Clinical Management Updates. This is Dr. Raymond Sarmiento from the National Telehealth Center, National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila, signing off. And uh, everyone, please stay, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and let's... Uh, Mag-ingat po tayo sa lahat ng ating mga ginagawa as we move towards uh, the new normal. Uh, and uh, please keep an eye out po on the uh, announcements, not just for this webinar, but also uh, from, uh, from official channels in terms of the quarantine measures that will be, uh, will, will, it be will it continue, will it be lifted, ganun po. Maraming salamat po and thank you so much. Thank you sa inyong lahat. Maraming salamat.